So I'd, I'd like to uh, just go through uh, some data processing that I did on a couple of projects, uh, both with Geoscience BC. And uh, first I'll introduce the problem, the, the reason why we went to a, a more involved data analysis. Talk a little bit about background. You've had a little bit from Mike, so I can go over this fairly quickly. Uh, give some examples of different interpretive approaches. And, uh, and also pick up a little bit on, on the topic Mike raised is using catchment analysis to go back and look for exploration opportunities and also to design the next survey in an area. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, um, some of this work was done with, uh, initially with IO Global and then subsequently while I was employed by CSA Global. The, um, Funding for the projects was given to us by Geoscience BC, and um, Yao Shui from the BC Geological Survey provided the catchments for both projects. And uh, I'd also like to thank support from uh, the AIG branch uh, and the invitation to come and speak today. So uh, the, the problem we have is that quite often uh, because we're dealing with stream sediment data and with regional surveys, we have quite variable background values. So this can cause some complications in trying to interpretate, interpret what an anomaly is, because we have different lithologies. Uh, there are other processes happening to stream sediment samples. We could have sca scavenging of metals as well, causing elevated uh, false anomalies for some commodity elements. Uh, we have different size catchments, so the dilution effect on our geochemistry is going to vary with that catchment size, so how do we correct for that? And then what is the optimum uh, catchment area that we're going to use for a particular survey? So Mike touched on that. So we need to use that to become more efficient in our exploration. So basically we want to go from a typical dot uh, thematic map on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, and we want to get to a catchment targeting map uh, on the other side. And another way to represent the data is, is to use a percentile gridded map. This is sort of stepping back and taking a, a broad view of the data. Uh, this example is from southern British Columbia for a project that I did with IO Global um, back in 2011. And uh, what we did is we leveled the, um, the copper data using a simplified lithology, plotted that up, and then we've superimposed structural trends on the data. And, and from regional geochemical data, even stream sediment data, uh, you can start to see some structural controls on some of those anomalies. And uh, for reference, uh, Highland Copper sits right in that area, in that big anomaly. So how do, how do we go about the process of uh, catchment analysis? Uh, we have to pull together our data sets. Uh, a few speakers have touched on this. We have to make sure everything's in the right datum. We have to bring our geochemical data in and condition it and decide what elements are, are we going to use. Uh, some, some data sets are going to be highly censored for some elements, and we don't want to use that in a multivariate analysis. We need to obtain an, a suitable DEM, and Mike touched on that. Some different DEMs are going to give you different results when you calculate hydrology from them. We have to validate sample locations, um, and if you're going back into historical data that predate the use, widespread use of GPS and collecting uh, locational information, it, it's a major headache, and as Mike pointed out, the consequences of putting your sample on the wrong drainage can be um, quite dramatic. Then we need to, to generate uh, individual catchments for each sample. And then we're going to attribute those catchments with geological uh, regolith information um, and uh, terrain information. So I'll, I'll show you a few slides just stepping through some of the process. The example I'm using here is the White Gold District in, in the Yukon in Canada. So we're looking at a, a DEM uh, that was derived from uh, S, 
SRTM data. Um, one thing you'll notice, you may not be able to see it up there, but in, in detail, the uh, derived hydrology from, from the DEM is not exactly matching the published hydrology available from, from the Yukon government. So there's quite often with different DEMs, you, you do have these locational differences that are going to affect how, how you generate your catchments. So uh, one of the issues is, is going back and validating um, sample locations. Um, I have tried the automated processes before, but in, in general, it, it, it often generates so many uh, errors that, uh, at least for the work that we did in British Columbia, uh, we went back, fortunately, because there were scanned copies of the original sample location maps available. So what I have here in, in light blue is the modern hydrology. And in the background is a scanned georeferenced uh, image of the original sample location map taken many decades ago when the sample was collected. The, uh, the sample location in the database wasn't far off where the sample was collected. But you can see here's the drainage on the topographic map that was used to guide the sampling program. And you can see it doesn't really match the modern drainage. Uh, and in fact, I believe that intersection there is probably that intersection there and sorry can't you see my mouse ah okay there we go so that uh, I believe that is actually this over here and this tributary is probably that coming off the main stream. So in the end, we just manually moved that point to that position and then drew that catchment for it. So there's a bit of subjectivity involved in this, um, but it, it's certainly a, a tedious process going through uh, several thousand stream sediment locations and checking them all. Um, but we decided it was worth doing because there's no point in doing all the subsequent processing if there's a question mark over where the sample came from. So once you're satisfied that you've got your samples in the best locations that you can, you can um, devise, uh, then we generate a, um, a, a catchment for each one. This used to be done manually, uh, where people would trace around the heights of land for a catchment. Uh, now there's automated software. Uh, different packages have different pluses or minuses. Um, one of the best commercially available is uh, the hydrology module in Discover, uh, working with MapInfo, uh, because it actually generates the catchment four prescribed sample location points. And then now what I'm showing here are a, a number of gridded images for that, that large area that includes the white gold district in the, in the red box, shown right there. Uh, one of the reasons I looked at this area is because when I arrived in, in Canada, uh, there was a staking rush going on in the Yukon and the White Gold District. There had been a discovery made. The, uh, some of the geologists, Canadian geologists working in the area, said it was too bad the stream sediments didn't work. I thought, well, that doesn't sound right to me. Uh, really, what, what the issue was, and you saw a, a diagram um, in one of Ryan's talks showing the minus 80 mesh gold data from the open file data from the Yukon. Uh, the gold data aren't reliable, and, and so the problem was for for the golden saddle deposit, which is right there, you can see there's not much of a, a gold anomaly associated with it. But there is a little bit of there is a little bit of arsenic and there is a little bit of antimony, and you can certainly see the arsenic standing out on the coffee gold project that Gold Corp has recently purchased, and uh, antimony as well. So putting together um, uh, additive index using leveled data, so so analyses leveled against uh, the dominant bedrock lithology, you start to pull up an anomaly associated with that gold deposit. Uh, but it's quite subtle, and, and really what we're talking about and going back through historical data is we're not looking for really whopping anomalies. We're going back, we're doing sort of a looking for second and third order anomalies that are in the data, which you have to do a little bit of processing to bring up. So different, there's, there's a whole number of data analysis approaches that you can take. I've, I've uh, been looking at a variety of these over the years. Um, 
basically, as we go down the list, they become increasingly mathematically complicated until we get down to machine learning, and then I'm lost. So I work with Eric Grunsky, uh, formerly of Geological Survey of Canada, who's uh, on top of the mass and, and does a lot of the machine learning uh, analysis for projects that I've been involved in. And I, uh, mercifully, I won't show you all those. I'll, I'll show you a couple examples from northern Vancouver Island. So this was a project uh, done for Geoscience uh, BC um, just a few years ago. What the Geological Survey of, uh, of British Columbia and also the Yukon have been doing is going back in, into their archive data sets from regional geochemical survey um, programs going back over decades. They archived pulps from those programs. Uh, they've been recovering those pulps and doing ICP MS analysis of, of those samples. So the dots in yellow are samples that have been reanalyzed and then they went in and they did a follow-up program as well. Uh, and then Yao has generated catchments for me. So when you look at that data, um, it looks like it's had pretty good coverage. In fact, it's had, it's had a follow-up survey. So you would tend to think that there's not much opportunity left in, in that particular neck of the woods. But we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So one of the major controls on regional stream sediment data is going to be lithology. And so in terms of querying this information using the catchments, because remember, once we have a catchment, we have a polygon. So we, now we can query in GIS, we can query different layers. But we don't want to query formations because that doesn't give us lithological information. So quite often what we'll do is do a simplified lithology classification. And in particular for northern Vancouver Island, one of the big problems in terms of interpreting copper data from this part of the country, which is a, a known porphyry copper gold uh, mining district, um, is this pink stippled unit, which, which is the Karmutsen basalt. And if we look at a plot, percentile gridded image plot of the raw copper, you can see there's a very strong control on that copper distribution from the basalt. Uh, but granted, you know, there's still a few places out here where you can see anomalies that are associated with, with known copper deposits and occurrences. So, so the raw data have worked, but as soon as you start to throw in some interference from a, a lithological unit with high copper, we start to have problems seeing through it. Uh, and we also have something coming up, which is the Mount Hall Gabbro, which isn't really at, at the level of mapping that we're looking at, didn't come out as a distinct lithological unit. So just looking at a couple of different simple data treatments. Um, on one side, we've got the copper leveled by dominant lithology. And, and then we can even go simpler than that. You can level the data by the presence or absence of basalt in the catchment. Because again, we've queried, we've queried the um, bedrock lithology. We know the percentages of different lithological units in each catchment. We can designate those catchments that have basalt and those that don't. We can level against that, and you can see even that simple leveling procedure has produced a very similar, uh, similar map. And in particular, there's some anomalies coming up in, in the level data that I'm starting to see in different products as well. So that's starting to give me confidence that the data processing is, is producing real anomalies. It's not necessarily an artifact of any particular processing method. Uh, another approach is to work out a weighted background value for the catchment. So if, if we have a, an average or median uh, background value for individual lithologies and we know the proportion of each of those lithologies in the catchment, we can calculate what an average background value should be for that catchment and then we can look at the actual value from a sample collected at the mouth of the catchment and the difference will tell us whether we have something interesting, interesting or not. And the map is a gridded image of the residuals of that process. So it's the actual observed value less the calculated average background value for the catchment. And again, it's, it's not dissimilar to the, the product that we were generating simply by looking at level geology. <clears throat> so there are a number of assumptions that you have to have to make when you're doing this sort of work. So 
One is that the samples are correctly located. If, if you're deriving bedrock geology from the wrong catchment, obviously this isn't going to work. So, hence, again, the reason we put a lot of effort in trying to locate the samples accurately. The other thing is you need to have good geology of your catchments. And in some frontier areas around the world, you'll, you'll be exploring in areas where there is no bedrock geology map that you can work from. So you're going to be stumped there. That the lithological uh, description and character of those map units is well known and consistent. And that there are no minor units uh, within the catchment that have not been mapped that are going to have a strong, uh, if you like, uh, uh, overly uh, influencing geochemical influence. Uh, black shales would, would be an example, perhaps metalliferous black shales. Uh, the other example from northern Vancouver Island was the Mount Hall Gabbro, which has a lot of copper associated with it, but didn't come out as a mapped unit. And then you have to make the assumption, if we're looking at a weighted average, is that each of those lithological units are each contributing equally to the sediment load at the sample site where the sediment was taken. And we know that's not true either, because we know different lithologies have different erodibilities. Uh, it's going to be controlled by relief, particularly in mountainous areas. So again, it's an assumption we make, but we know it's not particularly um, correct in a lot of instances. I'm going to talk next about a different approach, which is just to look at the data and internally drive what those lithological controls are. Uh, and the assumption we have to make there is that we can interpret principal components. So I have well under three minutes to explain principal component analysis. <laughs> That's okay. Basically, we're looking at clouds of data, and we're looking at stretching within those clouds, and then we're looking at different axes orthogonal to it. So in regional data sets, the first principal component is typically lithologically controlled. And in this case, I'm looking at PC1 from northern Vancouver Island. There is the felsic response. In a negative space, we have a mafic response. And as part of that mafic response, we have copper. So we want to filter that out. So just to check that, here's a pot of raw copper. The stippled area, again, is the Karmutsen basalt. And you can see that, now I've inverted the PC1. It had negative loadings, so I've inverted it so it comes up as hot colors on the um, gridded percentile map. And you can see we get a really good match for the Karmutsen. So now we have a geochemical fingerprint of one of the units that's interfering with our copper signal. I sound a bit like a geophysicist sometimes when I talk about this. So now that we've characterized the Karmutsen basalt and the copper associated with it, what we can do is we can do a regression analysis of copper against that principal component. So here's, here's our basalts here in red with the, with the uh, strong negative loadings. Here's our felsic ones here. But really, that's okay. That's all background. These are the samples we're interested in. These are the copper anomalies that can't be explained by the lithology. And then what we do then is plot up uh, a map of the residuals. So these are, are copper that can't be explained by the Karmutsen. And again, we get that Mount, Mount Hall Gabbro. But also what you'll see is we're starting to pick up a lot more of the known copper occurrences. And we can test that. What we did was we looked at the uh, true positive. So those copper occurrences that occurred in the upper 90th percentile of a processing method. And the base example was the raw copper. And here's a variety of, of uh, individual methods of processing the copper data. And you can see we're increasing the number of true positives that we're getting. And then we add in productivity, which is a correction for dilution. It goes up again. We go to a weighted sums model, which involves several elements. Uh, and that's an improvement. And then when we correct the weighted sums model for dilution, we get our best response. So now we're getting over 200% more true anomalies from the process data than we were from the raw copper data. And just to finish up and to, to take a bit more uh, uh, along the line that Mike was getting to, if, if you plot, plot your value against catchment area, you often see this decay. Our highest values are typically in small catchments. You can decide at an arbitrary point uh, which is the optimum catchment size you didn't want to go above. Uh, in, a, in a little bit, in, in some ways, it's like doing geostatistics on your data. 
Uh, in this case, I've picked 10 kilometers as square kilometers as the maximum size we should have. We go back to our catchments and color those areas in orange that have greater than 10 <laughs> square kilometers. You can see there's still a lot of opportunities available in North Vancouver Island. So uh, to conclude, um, it's very easy to correct for the effects of uh, interfering geochemistry uh, in stream sediment data. Uh, but of the, the, the methods I've looked at, um, using several commodities or pathfinder elements and correcting for dilution works best. Um, and then you, get, you can see existing deposits much better and that's generating new targets for you. And then we can empirically assess the data and decide if what the optimal sample spacing is going to be or catchment area is going to be uh, to optimize our, our survey. So you don't want to oversample, but you don't want to undersample either. And then finally, um, all this work that I've done is, is available uh, online uh, from Geoscience BC. And that's it.